Hi, and thank you. It's it's really great to be back, and I hope everyone is having a fantastic Friday. Um, so um, what uh, I'll be doing today, just to get us started, is just kind of giving a brief um, review of some of the things that I was talking about yesterday, and then uh, picking up from where we left off yesterday in terms of talking about um, other modes of time that we can take on in terms of writing and teaching writing. And um, for me, the reason why it's very important to always consider both the theoretical and the practical and or um, the ways in which we think through certain things and then also how we put them into practice, uh, both as writers and as instructors. Um, is because by thinking through these things, uh, it kind of gives us a bit of a um, of an insider's look into how thinking about these uh, considerations uh, affect us, and therefore uh, we can think a little bit more about um, how it affects others as well. So um, yesterday. One of the things I may have mentioned is that uh, I don't ask my students to do things that I myself would not do. Um, and so in order for me to serve as, I, I guess, like the best rhetorical model, I should say, that I, I feel that I could be, or at least that I try to be, um, I think about things and theories and approaches and methodologies um, in different ways regarding um, how they impact, their impact on me as a um, multiply uh, marginalized person, and then thinking about how that might affect other people too. And that's one of the ways that I try to practice that uh, thing that I call generosity with effort. Like it's not just enough to try to be nice because that can also be paternalistic and, um, you know, sometimes racist and ableist as well. So um, I, I want to th think through some of these other modes of time, ask us to consider some things, and then uh, really briefly touch on um, a, a little bit about universal design and how um, a lot of the times we tend to tout that as something that can help us reach uh, the most students that we can. But um, I tend to always think about universal design with a grain of salt for uh, reasons um, that, uh, it, uh, things that it leaves out and things that it sometimes includes, which can be harmful. Um, and then just taking us through some terms and, and concepts for us to engage before we uh, start to ask some questions um, and then engage in a short writing exercise and that writing can look like anything, notes, scribbles, um, pictures, anything. And then having us kind of share that and then ending with those questions that are geared for students. Because of course, one of the things that we all need to do as instructors is we need to stop thinking about issues of inequality and inequity as only um, being concerns for marginalized people. Um, part of the job is also, of course, to teach students who may be more privileged how to start making space for marginalized people, for those uh, voices, and um, thinking about how to also um, start writing with that empathy uh, that we hope all writers can take on. Um, so first, I'm gonna go ahead and start uh, by kind of taking us through some of those slides from yesterday. Some of these slides are from yesterday. Some of them I've added uh, and some uh, from yesterday I deleted. So if somebody uh, needs the slideshow, uh, presentation from yesterday, just uh, let me know. Uh, and now I need to do the share screen thing. 
I'm very weird when it comes to Zoom. All right, so uh, I'm deeming this uh, the Kairos Kronos and pedagogical uh, consultation uh, talk part two, although of course this is more of us um, engaging with each other. So yesterday uh, I shared a slide that showed a bunch of different dots coalescing around uh, what seems like a circle from, um, from the outside, so to speak. It's this phenomenon of a circle that is really an illusion because it is just created by all these different dots. And so I related that to that concept of time that Blau talks about, uh, which he calls uh, the name of his book, uh, The Colonizer's um, Model of History and, and Time and all that and stuff like that. So what I thought was interesting is that after doing that and then after going to C's, I ended up um, on Instagram as always, and the algorithm um, showed me this, which I thought was really interesting because of that image that I had chosen. And now it gives us a different uh, notion, um, which, you know, doesn't just show that tunnel, but actually tries to um, deconstruct it. And so what the, what the image shows is the current state of knowledge and education where um, cultural knowledge is restorative justice, as ethnic studies and critical pedagogies are just this tiny dot within a large circle of Eurocentrism, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. And of course we would include uh, colonialism in that too. And then on the bottom, it says how knowledge actually exists. It's not irrelevant, but rival knowledge is those things that we're striving for. And when we think about, um, all of the cultural knowledges at our, um, now, especially with the internet, right? Um, we can go out there and we can find that information, but of course the best way to think about that is how we create connections that are much more reciprocal and then Eurocentrism seems to just kind of recede. And so yesterday uh, I was asking us to think about how writing is a way of discovering, learning, and thinking, and then what that has to do with time and temporalities. Um, and so one of the things that I hope um, was clear, because I get very nervous at these things, is uh, the ways in which we need to start thinking about time um, in a way that really deprivileges uh, this certain framework that really stresses that time is money and that productivity is what makes us valuable. And so again, right now during this pandemic, people are trying to make time, right? Uh, cutting out extra uh, lessons sometimes, um, which means that sometimes uh, more time is dedicated to an assignment, but of course what ends up happening is that there's more writing on that assignment. So um, sometimes it might have that unexpected consequence that uh, you might end up uh, working with students for whom um, that supposed break doesn't really help much because it doesn't do much to mitigate uh, their fears uh, of, of what's going on um, in the classroom. And uh, getting us to think about space and time. And so yesterday I was talking about Kairos and Kronos, Kairos being the right time or uh, in space. It's usually called place, but it's really about space. Uh, the difference being it's, it's who's invited into that space. And um, Kronos being that long trajectory of history that actually leads to a particular time. And so even though I was talking about how that manifests in the way that different people write, I also want us to think about these in terms of actual lived existence, right? So we can think about the time of uh, consultation uh, when students uh, go to the writing center to ask for assistance as that chirotic moment where we can make things happen and make space and things like that. But we also have to always be uh, 
aware of the chronos of the situation of what is leading up to that. Um, and so this will include the person's history, their navigation of academia, um, what that has done for their relationship to, uh, to and with writing. But of course, also uh, all of those real world exigencies that um, affect how we learn, affect how much time that we have and um, how much, uh, you know, I think sometimes we think about it as how much effort we can dedicate. And I think that's kind of an ungenerous way. Um, how much we can actually give at a certain time um, to each aspect of our life, right? So we can start thinking about it that way. But part of the problem is that we do not have the right to demand people's histories, right? And sometimes we are working from a place of generosity, or at least we think of, of it as that, as, as such, but the problem is that um, we haven't really made room for certain uh, experiences. And so that happens a lot in um, the classroom sometimes when, uh, you know, notions of rigor, people uh, sometimes think, well, just because there's a pandemic doesn't mean that I'm gonna be less rigorous because my students need to know these things. Um, it's not to discount what, our students may need, um, especially when we think about it in terms of what happens beyond school. But uh, of course, part of our job, if you really do think that it's to prepare people for the quote unquote real world as the school is not part of that, um, part of, of preparing people for the real world is for them to know that their health, um, their safety is important, right? And so a lot of the times what we need to start thinking about um, when we assist students um, is helping them to understand the way that these structures, these expectations have been constructed habitually. So uh, in my own uh, pedagogical experience, what has often happened is that students do not understand or they don't realize, uh, perhaps because they've never experienced it, that there are other ways of existing and being within the classroom, uh, within school, within academia itself. Um, I myself have experienced those things where it gets to the point where even though you're dealing with some really, really um, difficult circumstances in, in your life, whether it has to do with uh, your health or with your family, the pandemic right now, uh, but sometimes we get so wrapped up in this idea that we have to get things done and they have to get things, we have to get them done now or else everything falls apart. Um, to the point where when you speak to students and say, it's all right, you know, um, we can do this differently. Um, sometimes they're very surprised because um, it has never been their experience where, uh, well, quite frankly, someone has spoken to them as a human being, right? With real needs and experiences. And so um, for me, I think that's where the Writing Center makes a really great intervention uh, because sometimes professors, um, even with the best intentions, might not be able to uh, have those kinds of relationships, uh, especially those one-on-one -on -one, uh, times to talk and, and think about things. And so I think when it comes to visibility and invisibility, um, uh, writing center consultants um, are some of the most important people that help our students feel seen, where um, it might be something as simple as it's, it's going to be okay, we're going to, we're going to get through this, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, as scary, or hopefully not scary, and things like that. Um, and that's just like on the, on the outside. Um, but of course, Part of the, that work is also about rendering students visible, um, 
not necessarily being um, ready to diagnose a student's needs or uh, what they're doing wrong, even when we think, well, you know, the teacher's going to want to see this. Um, but really listening to students in terms of what they see their goals as. And so um, when I am in the classroom and I try to set up the classroom where I can talk to, to small groups or go person by person over several uh, class meetings, I ask them, um, what are your goals and, and how do you see writing as meeting those goals, like beyond this, like after you graduate, like who do you see yourself communicating with? Um, and then that kind of helps us to start uh, thinking through uh, writing as relationship. And then also asking them, you know, who are some of the audiences that you really want to be able to share this with that you sometimes think, you know, um, who's going to want to read this paper? <laughs> right, and things like that. Um, if you wanted them to read this paper, how could uh, how could we start making it more uh, open? And um, we often talk about access in the classroom and accessibility in terms of openness um, to others, right? Especially those who have been othered, capital O. Um, but also being kind of... Um, upfront about being able to hold space um, without stereotyping. So one of the things that I, I do when I start any semester is you have the template, uh, the template for um, disability services and uh, the school expects that that is on the syllabus and all it does is give them the number. Um, and I add my own, uh, access statement there where I talk about my own disabilities and I say, so as a result of these disabilities, uh, these are some of the things that I do to keep myself, um, you know, uh, on top of things. Um, but just know that because I know sometimes it's difficult, uh, if there's anything that I can do to make class uh, more receptive to your needs, we can do that, you know, because legally accommodations are for uh, students with paperwork, but in terms of race and class and, and gender, um, a lot of the times disabilities either go misdiagnosed, overdiagnosed, or they are used to discount students' experiences. And um, it is my belief that a, an effective teacher um, knows that different people learn differently. So there are different ways of, of presenting information and, and things like that. So um, those are some of the, the ways that we can just, to, you know, to, to start thinking about how we create um, genuine, uh, authentic ex uh, relationships with people. And I know that uh, in rhetoric, we often have problems with words like genuine and authentic, but uh, I use them in terms of like psychology because I have a, a psychology background from my master's um, where the idea is that to the best of one's ability, you are being um, open and receptive to people. So um, we left off yesterday thinking through other modes of time. And for me, this is really important because a lot of the times when we think about disability, we often, uh, in a lot of scholarship, unfortunately, really takes up disability in a very um, white feminist sort of way, where disability is, is uh, separated and disconnected from other issues that are very important. A lot of the times it might be thought of as gendered, it might be thought of in terms of class, you see that a lot. Um, and then when you see it in terms of race, um, you don't necessarily see it in terms of gender. And so the reason why this matters um, and the reason why I opt for thinking about different modes of time through a decolonial lens is that decoloniality has to do with really um, 
analyzing, tracing, and critiquing the ways in which all of these systems of oppression are intertwined. So if you study, uh, you know, histories of race and disability, or you read stories about people's experiences, we come to know that disability has actually been constructed through racist frameworks. So for example, Ellen Samuels uh, talks about the ways in which um, ideas of normal, normalcy and the norm, which we often use uh, when we're norming grading, whatever that means. I, I quite frankly, I hate that uh, expression um, because I think it does, it's trying to do well but again, it's holding students to particular uh, standards where um, they might not necessarily all need the same thing, right? Um, and so I have problems with, with grade norming uh, in terms of that. Um, and I prefer to work with my students. Um, but um, we have to be careful about norming uh, writing practices too, right? When it comes to how to best assist students. But um, the reason why I engage a decolonial lens for thinking through these things, especially when it comes to issues of productivity uh, and temporal labor, is because uh, a decolonial lens does illuminate that history of the ways in which disability has been constructed as deliberately racist. So if we study the history of people like Blumenbach and Linnaeus who attempted to um, categorize human beings in, in, into different races, um, that happened through disability. The idea that some people are much more uh, prone to savagery and some people you know, are um, created or built uh, to, you know, for full entelechy, to be a, a, a super full human, uh, so to speak. Um, and so it works the other way too, uh, right? So that uh, when we think about racism, it is undergirded by ableism, uh, whether or not that person is disabled. And so what that often does is that it, um, it discounts people's ability to contend with disability uh, more upfront and clearly. Uh, and of course it, it serves to, um, yet again, denigrate disability because you're attaching it to the stigma of race. And of course it has severe implications for real people who are racialized and then um, seen through uh, that intersectional lens. So for example, um, I, in my first year writing class, um, I have taught uh, the story about Junius Wilson, who he was a deaf black man living in the South who was institutionalized for decades. Um, and he spoke black ASL, but because all of the, um, uh, the doctors and teachers and, and, and everybody involved in that case um, were only thinking through white ASL, they started to say, oh no, he can't communicate. He has to be institutionalized. And it all becomes this uh, struggle to centuries, uh, not centuries, decades later, get him released and, and um, some sort of um, compensation from the state, which of course uh, can never really account. It can't ever account for that loss of time, right, uh, of one's life. And then of course, uh, part of the other thing we need to think about when it comes to gender is I tend to think about gender as part of race. So for example, when we think about uh, instances of misogynoir, uh, which are, um, which is racism that targets black women specifically, a lot of the times when we see that intersection with disability, it becomes especially dangerous. Um, uh, so there's a, besides the fact that um, many uh, disabled people have uh, 
become um, victims of state violence, uh, seen as dangerous because they were black and disabled. Um, it has often been used to um, discount people as well, the, you know, the stereotype of, of the hysterical Latina or the angry black woman and, and things like that. And so again, it keeps um, attention trained off of actual disability uh, where we can uh, assist people. And uh, again, really reinforces these racist uh, tropes of, of, um, of people. And it, and it always comes back to gender. And, and so uh, if we think about the ways in which uh, trans folks are especially targeted, uh, for example, how um, the experiences that they've had to go through when um, they are seeking to emigrate from Central America during the so-called current crisis and the way that becomes an issue of disability uh, as well when uh, we understand that people don't have access uh, to particular um, medications and treatments, and when they ask for them, it becomes a way of, of tormenting human beings, right? So um, for me, I think it's very important that when we do think about disability, we start to think about it intersectionally, because disability um, manifests differently, and it it is corporeal, it is embodied, but what leads to that embodied condition is very different for different people, okay? And so um, because of that, when we talk about making space to listen rather than to silence people, we need to think about how to make space for different people with different needs. And if we talk about how to make space for students to be heard rather than spoken over, well, that's going to require very different uh, tactics. And so um, bringing these two together uh, is, is the framework that I use in my pedagogy and when I try to uh, help students where they're at get to where they're going. Um, so thinking about how they can relearn and or reclaim um, communal practices. And so um, I think it's good that we're living in a time when, um, especially through our friends uh, who um, are in C's and in other organizations, we're seeing a lot of work about linguistic justice. Um, as Antaldua said, um, I am my language. And when you discount that, you are discounting me. And not just because it's me speaking, but it's my family and my ancestors and everything that they have had to go through speaking through me. So when you say that that's not good enough, then I take umbrage, right? Um, but if we think about it, when um, uh, for a lot of communities, especially native communities, um, that relearning has also to do with relearning languages that were deliberately targeted um, for being stamped out. And um, what's great about that, uh, that they're reclaiming their languages is that it, it is part of decolonization, but it also uh, reinforces the fact that there are different epistemologies uh, at play in our world. And that's where that notion of space and time comes in. We exist, those of us with different histories exist within a different space time than other people. So when I talk about these issues, for me, it becomes uh, an issue of 500 years of, of colonial history, uh, as well as European ancestors who were forced to leave, um, you know, for religious reasons and things like that. So what does it mean for us to take on the work of writing, uh, of speaking and also teaching um, when we have those commitments, right? And so every student's commitment is different. Um, and even within the now, it might be that it, you have a student 
whose primary purpose is I need to get a job and take care of my family. I need to get them um, naturalized, right? Um, things like that. Um, but of course, also understanding that when we welcome other epistemologies and languages into writing spaces, we can sometimes come up with, we find a lot of extraordinary beauty there that often gets erased with this idea that we should all kind of speak the same. So um, sometimes uh, when I work with my international students, they ask if they can write um, in Vietnamese or, um, you know, uh, a lot of uh, the different languages that we have in, in our classroom because we're a very international city. And I always tell them to go for it. And then, um, when they're explaining it, I mean, I trust them that, you know, they're, that they're not writing something else. Um, and I think that trust is important. But sometimes what they will do is that in translating their writing, um, we get insights into the ways that certain concepts are talked about uh, in another language. And so one of the examples that I give is, um, in Spanish, um, there are certain words that just don't translate. And so um, one example is desahogar. Um, and it means when you finally just go and you, you let it out and you tell people and you unburden yourself. But the word itself actually means to unchoke or to undrown. Uh, so in other words, really talking about that experience of I cannot speak. Um, and it's literally, you know, it doesn't even allow me to breathe. And so what does that mean, you know, um, for inviting, inviting that into the classroom or the consultation space when a lot of the times, um, you know, people being multilingual has been used as a way of saying, well, you're not a good writer or you belong in this classroom or or that course and things like that. Um, how can we make that a focus of, um, of starting from there and, and um, cultivating that rather than seeing that as an, a disability, which is the way that it has often been diagnosed in our education system um, over the last 200 years. Um, thinking about respect, relationality, and reciprocity when it comes to disability is also really important. So Sean Wilson talks about this. You can't just talk about people uh, and assume that you have the right to, to talk about them when you don't know them, when you don't know anything about their communities. And so think about what that means when a teacher says, no, this, this student, uh, they don't belong in college. I mean, have, you know, sometimes it doesn't occur to us that maybe that person is working two, three jobs to sustain a family or uh, has a, a lot of other um, responsibilities and they're doing their best. Um, and so a basic respect, we can even think about it as there are things about a person that I can't possibly know. And so I'm not going to automatically assume. Relationality and, um, you know, Sean Wilson talks about this, but so do people like Jacqueline Jones Royster, right? Like you can't just um, go in there and speak over people. Um, it's a very different relationship um, when it comes to uh, research, when you are making relatives of people and Andrea Riley Makovic talks about this. Um, what does it mean to make relations of people rather than to just make them the little s subject? How do we make them the big s subject? Now, this is really important because for a lot of disabled people, we have often been the little s subject where the idea is to help us because we cannot help ourselves. Um, even recently with someone that I have known for 20 years, I recently got into an, a bit of an argument um, because I was talking about being a disabled uh, scholar. 
And she, she says, well, why do you consider yourself uh, disabled? You're not disabled. And I, I just kind of thought, what? Um, well, first of all, um, my prosthesis, which comes in a medicine bottle, uh, might not be as obvious, but it is there. And second of all, um, I am very much disabled when I'm not doing well and I cannot move and do the things that I might be able to do at different points in my life. Also, my neurodivergent uh, changes how I see the world, how I make connections, how I, I think through things. Um, and um, it makes me more aware of some things too. Um, and she was fighting me over the, the term disabled because for her, it's, it was a stigma. Um, and so disabled people are people that need help or they need help uh, by you know, us telling them what they need versus understanding that disabled people are very much um, aware of, of what we need. And sometimes we communicate that differently. Um, but that doesn't mean, mean that we are less human or um, that we are not communicating. Perhaps it might be that the other person just doesn't know how to interpret. And so uh, Remy Yergo's work um, on autistic rhetorics uh, talks a lot about this, right? Um, what does it mean um, to be a disabled person who knows that um, the medical, industry, we can call it that, is out to ensure that people like you do not exist. Um, what can we do to help people harness the voice that they do have rather than imposing these paternalistic saviory behaviors, right? And reciprocity. So again, um, when it comes to reciprocity, thinking about it in terms of race, gender, disability, um, that complex of identities, um, reciprocity is often not extended. So the idea is that if we are given space as a racialized person, as a disabled person, um, then people have certain expectations, right? They want to see the super crip story. Uh, disability can't get me down. Um, I'm... I'm awesome and, and you know, I become like that feel good story for people. And it's like, no. Um, or people take the other tack where it becomes like, um, I guess we can call it suffer porn where they expect to see that uh, with, um, with disabled people where we have to lay it all out there, right? And so, um, and again, we are seeing it every day in the news where people constantly replay, uh, I, I'm avoiding the news at this point because of course being from Houston um, and getting news secondhand, we see it all the time when people replay the video of, of you know, George Floyd. Um, somehow racialized disabled people, um, marginalized people are supposed to lay it bare or else people don't care. And even then that care is limited by how much uh, enjoyment almost people can get from that. And so um, it's not to say that we do that, but of course, you know, a lot of times it translates into instructors telling students, no, 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 code switch, code switch, because it seems awesome. Or uh, no, 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 you need to play this up so people can really see like what you went through. Um, and, it, and it comes from a place of trying to help, but it becomes this thing where um, you're hoping that a pity vote uh, will somehow get that person a platform. And then what happens is we accidentally reinforce this idea that people say, well, they're playing the disabled card, they're playing the race card. When we are literally trying, we're literally telling writers, students, that's what you should be doing if you want to get any attention whatsoever. And so reciprocity is really important. It has to do with 
how vulnerable you are expecting people to be um, and how much, how, how vulnerable you are uh, in turn um, allowing yourself to be. And it doesn't mean that we have to be uh, really open and tell each other our darkest secrets and things, but it does mean that an exchange cannot be monodirectional, right? It has to be um, a, a two-way street, maybe a, a three-way, four-way, one of those circles with all of the exits, um, where we have to understand that every time that we are engaging with a student, we have something to learn. Um, and if we aren't learning, then maybe there's something that we're shutting ourselves off of. Because, you know, as a phenomenologist, I tell my students, um, when you're picking up a basketball and you're only seeing the front, you don't know what the back looks like. It could be deflated and I'm fooling you because I'm holding it this way, right? Um, everybody has a slice of that that they can, that they have privy, that they're privy to. And so it's only by talking to each other that we can get a fuller picture. And so reciprocity is huge because oftentimes marginalized people, uh, we don't get that from others. And then uh, thinking about practices and methodologies in enough place. Um, so what does it mean for people to have histories, different temporalities, and then to inhabit the same spaces? Um, so I know that uh, MSU uh, sitting on um, uh, tribal territory um, is often really careful about talking about that history, right? Um, and so that's there. And so it asks us then to really think about what does it mean when we are talking about helping students who have been racialized and, and, dis and uh, rendered disabled um, in certain ways, when we start to think about um, our relationships to that land, um, because I can guarantee that notions of race and disability are very different for the people who exist with the land. Um, for example, when we start to reclaim some of our, um, you know, traditional stories, we see that disability um, is something that is often taken as um, something to be respected because it's a different viewpoint uh, rather than something to be shunned and, and uh, pitied. And so thinking about also what does that mean, especially when, um, so for example, I used to live in uh, Los Angeles and I taught uh, in South Central and what always struck me as interesting was that USC, which is this really, uh, it's, a, it's a private uh, university, et cetera, has this certain reputation. Um, and it was in the middle of um, several black neighborhoods. And then thinking about how that university did or did not actually do much for the people of that community. So for me, as someone who was teaching at an HSI, which is a Latinx serving institution, as a person who identifies as Latinx of indigenous ancestry, um, I have a very particular relationship to that space. Uh, and so that guides my relationship uh, with my students in very specific ways. Um, and so understanding, of course, that a lot of our students come from many different places. Um, I also think about what uh, perspectives they're bringing and what can we make with this when they meet in a, in some, in a way that's positive, that where we are building mutually respectful relationships um, within this space, um, right? And, and things like that. And then of course, a 
orientation. Uh, it's always activist, and so is, is decoloniality. Um, and so when we talk about being CRIP, which I identify as CRIP, it means that we are having a different relationship to time, place, and space. So CRIP is a reclaiming, right, of the term cripple. Um, uh, but CRIP is more of like a punk rock in your face. That's right. I'm disabled. I'm not apologizing for myself. And this is the perspective that I'm privileging as I navigate the world. Um, and of course, that makes you more attuned to what other people need. Um, how does time relate to that? Um, often disabled people are not given enough time to do the things that they want to do uh, because um, we're on a deadline, an arbitrary deadline. Often we are not welcome within certain places. Uh, so for example, if you've uh, been at seas, I, I found it really interesting that uh, in the Action Hub, it's a virtual space and, and the Committee for Disability Issues, um, which I'm currently co-chairing, has a booth there where you can uh, talk with us or you can uh, have access to certain resources. And um, the app gives you the choice to choose people to populate the space, including people with wheelchairs, uh, right, who use wheelchairs. And then the space itself is supposed to be a booth that is like, it has a step, but no ramp. And so again, that's just virtually. So what does that say for what we do in material spaces, in, in lived spaces, right? In, in places. And so that also has to do with space because a lot of the times when uh, disabled people say that's not gonna work for me, it becomes a case where, well, you know, um, we'll modify things for you. And as Stephanie Kirschbaum and others talk about, we can't retrofit because that often tells us that uh, disabled folks are not being planned for. Like we don't exist until we exist in that moment. And then suddenly it's like, oh crap. Um, so, you know, thanks, I guess, right? Um, and so we can think about crip as a noun, an adjective and a verb. And so Alison Kafer um, in, in uh, her book, Feminist Queer Crip, um, talks about what that, that could mean uh, at crip as an orientation where um, you are crip, but you're cripping things too, uh, or something is crip, meaning that it is designed for us um, so that we have access to that. And so these are some of the people who talk about those things, um, those ideas. And so the reason why it's important for us to start there, I think, uh, because yesterday, as I said, if we come up with a list of best practices without necessarily questioning ourselves, uh, why are we doing this or how are we doing this, then we run the risk of really just not necessarily being helpful, but um, just kind of imposing on, on students what we think that they need. So some of the things to consider is, you know, how are you thinking through things intersectionally? Now, um, Patricia Hill Collins talks about, um, and, and recently there's like that new book, which is uh, looking back at, at um, uh, all the years that, that um, she's been talking about intersectionality. Um, intersectionality isn't just, oh, that person's racialized, and disabled. It has to do with the ways in which race and disability work together. They are interactive and interconstructive, so to speak. And that means that the circumstances are very unique for different people. Now, the world is a big place. We cannot necessarily think we're gonna get it right 100% of the time, but we can definitely reorient our praxis so that it is open. Um, and if we can't, um, if, even if we are unsure how to proceed, we can at least learn from uh, experiences, right? 
Um, it has to do with positionality too. Uh, positionality is complex. Um, so this changes with context. Um, just because a disabled person is disabled doesn't mean that they don't have, for example, white privilege or class privilege compared to other people. And so uh, again, the needs are going to be very different uh, for different students. So one of the things that I often talk to my students about in class and, and something that I try to practice in my own pedagogy is this orientation from below. And so this comes to us from um, uh, people like uh, Sylvia Winter and uh, people who write about pluriversal uh, politics like Escobar. Um, the idea is that when we orient from below, we think about the most vulnerable people within a space or within a society, and we start building from there, knowing that everybody else will be taken care of, right? Um, so the idea is if we do that, then we know that the people who need the least help will, uh, will also be helped too. And so what would that look like? Um, when we start gearing our practice um, towards uh, our con consultation work towards uh, that rather than um, thinking about, well, this is what a standard essay looks like. And, and so then, oh, now I'm going to have to extend more help rather than thinking about it in the other way around. Moving beyond mere listening. And so this has to do with that concept of rhetorical listening, which um, has been critiqued um, within um, scholars of color circles. The idea that we can learn about people kind of by eavesdropping. And, and so the problem is that that's not enough, right? Or we hear what we wanna hear. Uh, and um, that makes us think that we don't actually have to engage with people. Um, and so that becomes an orientation too of, um, I'm not just going to be listening for what I should be doing because in a way I'm like, okay, this is how I'm gonna respond. I'm actually going to think about knowing you and then um, thinking about how that can become the basis for a productive uh, uh, consultation or, or visit. And I know that, of course, it's not like we have tons of time when we visit with students, but I want us to think about what it would mean for us to reorient so that we can kind of um, start getting ready and be ready all the time, right, uh, for those uh, new introductions, I guess. And then confronting static notions of inclusivity uh, and um, vulnerability. Inclusivity is how we see each other as groups, right? Um, and so oftentimes, and, and I've been guilty of this myself, where we think that just because we're part of a community that we can make assumptions about people's experiences. Um, because there are some things that we can never know and sometimes students will tell you. And so that's kind of where that idea of, of uh, sharing positionality stories comes from of being receptive and allowing people to let you know um, where you can um, facilitate learning rather than assuming. And then practicing generosity with effort. And I think this is probably the most difficult because as teachers, as consultants, we want to help people. Um, and so sometimes generosity involves us letting students figure out what they want and then we can assist them with what they need for that. Even if we think that that doesn't necessarily align with what we would do, right? Um, and so also generosity means that sometimes what we do isn't going to necessarily be effective, especially when it comes to disabled and other marginalized folks who are so used to not being listened to that sometimes we do become um, resistant. Um, and, and there's lots of scholarship in ed that talks about this, and which is why building those relationships is important. Um, 
But also that generosity should extend to ourselves because we are not necessarily always going to know what to do uh, in that moment. So um, we have to do the best that we can um, with uh, the most, the highest ethics in that moment. Okay, so it's 2.30 and did we have more time? Yes, the floor is all yours right until four o'clock. Oh, okay. I'm like, sorry if I'm going on and someone has to go to the back. Um, okay, so I wanna talk to you a little bit about universal design now um, and then have that moment of, oh, but the caveat. Um, it's what, what we do, right? <laughs> um, so universal design uh, for learning uh, is something that comes out of architecture. It comes out of designing buildings um, to make them as accessible to all people as possible, right? So going with a ramp design rather than a ramp at the back so that you could put the stairs in the front, things like that. And so uh, universal design then comes to us through education, which is a field that took that up and said, what if we start doing that for uh for teaching, right? Um, so if anybody has ever been a public school teacher, you will recognize this setup. When you do lesson plans, which you have to turn in every week, you have your basic lesson, and then you have to explain how you will assist the honors or what they call uh, gifted and talented students in how you will help uh, the uh, English language learning uh, students and or uh, students who are in special education. So again, it sets up that idea of there being a standard student and then everybody else is just kind of an anomaly. Um, and so one of the things that Universal Design for Learning sets out to do is tell us, well, you know, we not only do we save ourselves a lot of work, but it's actually just good pedagogy for us to start designing courses and classes and lessons with everyone in mind, right? And what would that look like? And it kind of sometimes will mean that we turn the assignment inside out, where instead of telling students, this is exactly what we're gonna do, um, it becomes a case where it becomes more open and it starts with, well, what do you wanna do? How are you gonna meet this? And then each person can do that, right? Um, and so thinking about how we can offer people options for entering into a lesson or um, a paper. So one of the things that universal design teaches us or it should teach us is that there is a difference between access to information and access to learning. Just because we give students all of the resources, computers, um, library, databases, um, all the instructions that uh, we can give on an, an assignment. That's information. It doesn't mean that they it's access to learning because access to learning means that someone can take that and do something with it in, in, um, in a way that, um, behooves them. So if we think about when it comes to technology, Adam Banks uh, talks about this when he talks about the different forms of access. And then at the very uh, top of this sort of um, list, so to speak, is transformative access. It means that we don't just have access to things, but we have the ability to put ourselves into it and to uh, influence how that works. And so we've always got to think about how it is that we can invite students um, to see themselves in an assignment. And, and perhaps more than anything, that is probably the most difficult thing to do, uh, but also the most vital thing. Because until someone can see themselves in something, in an assignment, it just becomes a thing where either I'm going to do this rote style, I'm just, I'm going to follow the, you know, 
ABC and put it together and there it goes, you know, what, what I like to call an essay with no soul uh, or uh, writing that matters, right, to the person and matters in the sense that it and matters that person by allowing them to be present and visible in writing. So universal design says we need these three things, clear goals, individualized instruction and assessment. And so um, the writing center is usually the place where I see this happening um, for which I am always eternally grateful. I always tell my students, you know, be sure to thank people, you know, um, when you go there. Um, and, and you're not there to have them edit your paper either, right? Um, but, you know, I always ask them, like, you know, you need to go there with a set of goals. What do you want to accomplish by going there? You can't just show up and then be like, here, help me. Um, you have to take ownership. Like, what are your goals that, you know, for this consultation? And also, you know, for the project uh, overall. Um, and then going there and you're going to get individual help or in a group, um, but you have to know what works for you so that you can let the person know, right? Because sometimes, you know, some of us are better through having a conversation. Sometimes it's better, you know, for some people to write something out as, as the, as, as the consultant is, is, uh, you know, um, helping them as, as they actually work through a process. Um, and then, you know, how will you know that you have met this goal, you know? Um, and the reason being is that sometimes, you know, students will go to the writing center and especially, you know, um, in classes outside the humanities, it might be the case where, you know, uh, those of us in rhetoric and writing are trained, this is how it should be. And then they go to, you know, their science class or something, and the professor's like, why would you do this, right? Um, because that's how it is. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but, you know, I asked my students to figure these things out so that there is a plan. Um, but, you know, from the other perspective, um, I'm hoping that uh, when the student goes to the writing center, it allows the consultant to not have to um, try to figure out um, how to help the student um, in a way that uh, the student might then say, well, I wanted this, but they did that. And, and sometimes students will do that. Uh, and so this is a way of saying, no, like, we're going to do this and we're going to do this together. Uh, but that includes you. And so this is one way I think that uh, we can also give students ownership of, of their process because a lot of the times students, especially unfortunately in the underfunded uh, schools or um, uh, you know, in, in particular special ed programs, it becomes a case where they are told just do this without there being a way for them to to um, again, uh, take ownership of any part of that assignment other than completing it. Um, we think about usability. Um, what does it mean for instruction to be usable? Can I apply it? How would I need to have this instruction? Again, it has to do with, you know, um, do I do well? in dialogue, do I do well, um, you know, um, if I'm given a set of questions and then I can kind of figure out from there. Um, and so, again, I think that the Writing Center is, is in a really great position because y'all often do that where it's like, have some information, we have flyers, we have the website um, and, um, that's something where I think a lot of the times, you know, people teaching in the classroom, we can take lessons from that, uh, that multiple presentation. And so that's important too, because again, as, as, as Stephanie Kirschbaum says, we don't want to give the impression that we're, we're retrofitting. Um, this idea that 
the student comes to us and then uh, it's like, oh, I never thought about someone like you needing my help. And I think a really great um, resource for thinking through this um, is Elaine Richardson's uh, memoir, where she talks about when she was a student in university um, and going to the professor uh, and then also to the writing center. And she had a very specific vision for what she wanted her essay to do and the language that she wanted to use uh, was seen as too poetic or something like that. And so in the end, she ended up using it and the professor's like getting upset. And she was like, I told you I was gonna use it. Um, but it's interesting because when you read that section of the memoir, it's very clear that part of the thing is that they did not expect someone like her uh, and who they saw her as at the time to come in and have a uh, command of poetic language, right? Uh, even though she was writing an essay, you know, she was using very visual language. Um, and if we think now, of course, um, Dr. Elaine Richardson, of course, is a, to me, she's a legend, right, in, in our discipline. And one of the most amazing writers that you will ever meet. Um, Sometimes I have to slow down when I'm reading her stuff and be like, oh, wait. Um, but, you know, it, it's very apparent from that section in the book that they really just kind of were blowing her off because they did not have what almost seems like that hidden curriculum protocol, I guess, of how to deal with a student who has a clear vision rather than, um, you know, them being able to give simple help, send, send her on her way uh, because of, of who she was. So that's a, that was really interesting to me uh, about the book. Um, and then finally, universal design has these basic principles that we provide multiple flexible presentation, multiple flexible methods of expression and of gaining skills and multiple and flexible ways to engage. So what does that mean? Um, it means that, you know, this is one of those places where we're called to teach and say, okay, see if it works this way. And if not, let's try it this way. Um, and that's just uh, part of what we do. Um, but also with the understanding that every time we try something different with students, just because it, it supposedly didn't work doesn't mean it's just like, oh, then forget it. Let's move on to this. Students should still be gaining something from what didn't work for that specific moment, right? So helping students build their um, build their rhetorical toolboxes, so to speak. And again, um, you know, flexible ways to engage is helping students to realize that there are different ways to express the same thought, whether it's in different dialects or whether it's using different modalities, uh, different um, media, things like that. Um, and this becomes much more important as we all, uh, a lot of writing starts moving towards the web and things like that. But um, this is also going to be very important um, for students, again, from marginalized backgrounds because of the fact that um, how they want to express themselves may not necessarily be the way that the academy says that we should. Um, so some of the things to think about is really contending with that question um, that Vershawn um, brings up, um, or Vershawn Young, right? So the, this idea of, are we going to teach our students when to use particular voices and different um, ways of writing, or are we going to inform them that, you know, there are other ways of doing this? And, and that, of course, has to do with who the person is and who the instructor is, right? So my positionality, depending on who I'm speaking to, um, 
can either be helping students to learn more about who they want to be as writers, or it could be uh, interpreted as me demanding that they um, that they put on a particular uh, persona, right? Um, in order to get by. So we have to really, really think about that. So I promised that I would tell you the problems with universal design. Now, the problem with universal design is that depending on what material you encounter, universal design says we teach everyone um, to the best of our ability and we design as such. But there are some literature out there that still works off of diagnosis. Um, there's a, a book that I used with my students where I had to skip one or two chapters because they were, had um, models of the brain and said, if you're this kind of learner, you activate this part of the brain. And you know, if you have ADHD, it doesn't look that way and this and that. And I'm taking umbrage, right? As someone with ADHD and, and other disabilities, um, but I tell my students, it doesn't matter what part of the brain is lighting up or not. That's none of our business, right? Um, and if anything, that is part of the problem is that if you don't meet this particular criteria, criterion, um, criterion, sorry, um, then what ends up happening is that even though you're doing okay, it gets viewed through this lens of, oh no, this is, this is off somehow and I can't figure it out, that kind of thing. And, and so um, we need to avoid that sort of language and that tack where we are feeling like we need to diagnose people um, rather than figuring out how to meet them where they're at, right? And I know sometimes that it seems hard uh, where we think to ourselves, but if I don't try to diagnose the problem, uh, then how am I gonna help them? Well right there, it, that's the key, right? It's like, there's a problem and it's not the person, which unfortunately uh, is a difference elided a lot in academia. But also um, that's where the listening in comes in, but the active listening, the engagement where a student can tell us, um, this is what I need. And then, you know, okay that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing is that universal design, all too often uh, the literature uh, centers a white subject. So sometimes, a, a lot of the times, uh, literature on universal design isn't necessarily going to account for cultural differences in communication and um, cultural epistemologies and how they show up in our writing. And so that again can also lead to this misdiagnosis of someone not knowing how to write and things like that. So for example, we have students who come from cultures where citation isn't um, what you do. It can also, it can even be seen as insulting. You're telling your audience that, um, that you don't believe that they have read these things. Right. Or uh, if you think about the way different cultural groups argue, uh, so um, often students with indigenous backgrounds will use story to try to engage people and, and kind of illustrate the points that they're making. And in some classrooms, that's just not welcome uh, because, you know, a student is supposed to write in a very impersonal, uh, objective way. Right, and so we have to be really careful that we are not uh, assuming that something is a is detrimental or a deficit just because it is different. Okay, and so when I talk about universal design, I deliberately try to include things like ethno, racial, cultural difference within this um, because it's something that you're not often going to get in the uh, in the literature, the majority of it. Um, and so I think ultimately before we get started, because um, there is something that I would like for us to do together, um, is that more than anything, these are some of the things that we have to do. We have to acknowledge and confront our prejudices. 
Um, we, and, and we can think about prejudice rather than thinking of it as like, a, I don't like this person. It just is preconceived notions uh, of human beings, right? And, and again, I cannot stress that enough, especially at the intersections of race and disability, um, it could manifest as something like, oh my God, that's so good. Uh, it's like, as though somehow you didn't expect it to be or anything like that. Um, we just have to be careful about being respectful, right? And we have to study the complex ways that racism and ableist, ableism exist as a complex. Um, the way that they reinforce each other, uh, the way that even when we're being attuned to disability, we might be, um, we might have a white uh, disability lens, so to speak, to borrow from like the notion of white feminism. Um, we need to understand how they reinforce each other. And we need to reflect and see past historically ingrained stereotypes um, that affect our students. Um, so again, um, Stereotypes are created over time. Um, they are given uh, permanence by their repetition, but also through what Adela Licona calls non-images. And, and I mentioned that yesterday. Um, so a non-image is something that doesn't actually exist, right? And it's never actually even named sometimes but it's still seen as a threat. And so uh, Ligona talks about this in terms of Jan Brewer in Arizona, where she's running for office uh, for, it might've been re-election, I don't remember exactly, but what happens is she's running on this platform that relies a lot on this non-image of the dangerous um, undocumented immigrant from Mexico and mention certain things about how they do this and they do that. And um, as Adela tells us, if you look, if you do the research, there were no stories in the news about uh, any of these things happening. But as she says, it doesn't have to be true. The fact that it's not true makes it even scarier, right? Because it's constructed in that way. And so this might be part of where we have to confront the hidden curriculum that we have in our classrooms or in the writing center and things like that. Hey, Christina, mm -hmm. uh, yes. Karen here. Just wanted to issue a reminder that we are on EST. So we've got about seven minutes left today. <gasps> oh my God. I'm so sorry. It's the weird time zone jumble. I just, I just wanted to, to toss that out there. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. No, this uh, is fantastic. I just figured I would let you know. Okay. Um, so um, I have this list and there's a couple of other things here, some terms for us to think about. Um, and then those questions from yesterday, which I really was hoping to get through, but in, in my head, it's three. Um, so I apologize. I apologize. This was terrible um, of me. And uh, and then thinking through together. So this is uh, these are some of the questions that I was hoping we would have a chance to kind of work through together. Uh, but thinking about how disability affects differently marginalized groups, and uh, how we can start thinking about disability more intersectionally, and using this, how can we start? Uh, uh, by making students more aware of, of space and time of, um, and this is more of an advocacy, self-advocacy question of um, helping students understand that, you know, um, the pandemic has affected time uh, and apparently right now too, um, sorry. Um, but then also, you know, after this, you know, how can we start thinking about how to make space and time more inclusive to different bodies with different needs. And so uh, again, I apologize. I am so sorry. Um, I, I really was under the impression that, uh, that we were in the, 
same time zone for some reason. There is no need to apologize. I often get confused with the time zone since half my family lives in EST and half of them in CT. So I am regularly confused about when I'm doing Zoom dinners, when I'm supposed to be somewhere, that sort of thing. Um, but thank you so much. This was absolutely fantastic and so generative. Um, and I think given our writing center's real interest in everything stemming from, or ranging from, I should say, language diversity to decolonizing writing spaces to the ways that writing is an act of, of embodiment. I mean, this is all really, really right up our alley and really helpful to our staff. Um, folks, we have about five minutes left. Does anyone have questions, things they'd like to ask, things they'd like to know? And also, if you could send us a copy of today's slides, folks in the chat are asking if we can have them. Mm -hmm. So please, folks, feel free to chime in in the chat or out loud with questions. I will stop talking. Oh, um, I saw that. It may well be that as we wind down the afternoon on this April day, the folks are just kind of reflecting and taking it in. I know there's a lot of interest in the chat about thinking through these slides and the content from today. I can't thank you enough for making time during C's week of all things, which I don't, I don't think we really, I don't think anyone fully anticipated when we scheduled all this um, for you to be with us, Christina. Um, this has been fantastic. I know that this is, it's a big ask to do this during what is already a very busy week. I'm grateful for your time. I know we all are. Um, thank you so much. Um, hopefully we can collaborate again in the future. I think folks will probably be reaching out with questions since so much of your research interests overlap with so many of our students' research interests, which is a fantastic thing. Synergy, it's great. Um, um, if anybody wants to email me, I've added um, my Gmail there. Um, just because my school email sometimes filters emails even from other schools, it's weird. Yes, ours do as well sometimes. Microsoft Office does not play nice. But I keep getting an ad for if I want to buy a house. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, I want to say thank you so much. And, and this is... Oh my God, this is the second day this happens to me because I yesterday I was supposed to be staffing the uh, access table at C's in the virtual space. And uh, I'm pretty sure I got there <laughs> late because they're on EST also, I think. I, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> the print is on EST because I don't know why, they just are. <laughs> yeah. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos por estar aquí este viernes, aunque a lo mejor estén bien cansados. Uh, so thank you for being here on a Friday, even though uh, I'm sure you're all very tired. Um, feel free to email me if you have any questions, and I will email uh, Karen uh, the, uh, the slides right now uh, before I go back to that Access Hub. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you, Writing Center staff, for this fantastic final staff meeting for the year. Um, I appreciate all of you, and we look forward to seeing you at the Writing Center's open house. Um, for those of you who are attending C's, go enjoy the rest of the conference afternoon, and for those of you who are heading into your weekend, enjoy that even more. Take care, everybody. <laughs>